<clears throat> Today we continue with our passage, Genesis chapter 35. The long road of Genesis. So we're still there. And as I was looking at the book, Genesis chapter 35, and we're looking at verse 16 to 29. You know, I've been meditating this passage for the last two weeks or so. And honestly, I couldn't make one of it. And I was just understanding the, the passage until, to me, God spoke. And, and, and what it revealed was something I did not expect. It is the title of the message. The normal Christian life is the title of the message. And if I would ask you, what is a normal Christian life, right? How, how does it look? How does it smell? How does it feel? Because I think it's important for all of us to have a right appreciation of what a normal Christian life is all about. It's important to manage our expectations of the reality of what Christianity is all about. You know, lately I've been going to the gym um, for the last four or five months or so, and honestly, I don't feel the difference. But, you know, one of the things I realize is if I want to have a healthy body, I have to be used to the sensation of soreness. Right here, you're, you're always sore. I thought in gym, you can outgrow that soreness feeling. Apparently, you can't. It's always there. It's always painful. I don't do in, in swimming. Do you, are you always sore after? Right? Always. Eh? And I said, whenever I, I'm in the gym, I said, ang hirap, ang hirap. I mean, it's so difficult, it's so difficult. But I changed my mindset. I say, ang sarap, ang sarap, ang sarap. <laughs> and my coach finds it funny. But to me, I have to put my right mindset that this is it. If you want to be a soldier, you have to get used to being shout at. You can't have a sibuyas na balat. You got to be used of having your rights trampled. And if that... You have no rights. Who was telling me this? Uh, there's a new term in the millennials. Are you... What term is that? That you're used to saliva? What term is that? LC. LC. Who, who told me that term? Who's teaching me that term? You? Oh, yeah, my friend. LC. LC. Do you know LC in millennials? No. No? So no, one here, no one's millennials here, huh? And, uh, I don't know. Somebody my LC? Laway conscious. Where, you use a spoon and you want to use. Uh, no, I'm Laoi conscious. You know, you don't want to share stuff. Uh, LC, the LC. You know, in the school of Bambi, there's no such thing. I was surprised. They're super not LC because I saw one time I visited that plate. He drank coke after the, the guy drinks the same coke. They get the <laughs> so, what? What's, what's, what's the style here? And the guy approaching gets the one and then drinks the coke. They're not LC. Right? You know, if you want to be an engineer, guess what? Don't be disappointed with math. <laughs> what? Right? <laughs> Raphael cringed. Oh, math. <laughs> Don't be so disappointed. Because it's part and parcel of being an engineer. And this is it. You want a Christian life? Guess what? Expect a hard one. I realize that Christian life is a hard life because it's the very tool that God uses in preparing us for heaven. I never saw it that way. And I realized something. Earth is not the final destination. It is not the final destiny. It is the preparatory. As much as studying in La Salle is not the final destination. 
You have to put in the hard work as as much as PMA is not the final destination wherein you get shout at, wherein you you get woken up early in the morning to, to march and run X number of kilometers. That's not the final destination, but that is part of preparing you for the final destination. Christian, the Christian life is a hard life. And as we look at Genesis chapter 35, we see the, the life of Isaac ending and we see the life of Jacob in its twilight years. And I realize this, that the life of Jacob, the life of Abraham, the life of Isaac, the life of Paul, the life of every great believer is a life of hardship. That is the archetype of what a Christian life is all about. That is what we are to expect this side of heaven. Go now to Genesis chapter 35, verse 16. We'll be looking at verse 16 to 29. The typical Christian life. Remember, Jacob was the chosen one. Jacob, I love. Esau, I hate. We are talking, God is describing the life of the guy that he loved. Where Israel will, the line of the Messiah will come. And we pick up in verse 16. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when they were still some distance to go to Ephra, Rachel began to give birth, and she, and she suffered severe labor. <coughs> On that trip, Rachel starts. A heavy labor. We were not informed before this that she was pregnant. And this would complete the 12 tribes of Israel. Benjamin would be the fast, the last of the kids of Jacob completing the 12 tribes. Verse 17. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, do not be afraid, for now you have another son. Rather than Jacob comforting the uh, Rachel, who was comforting? The midwife was comforting. That was the desire of Rachel. When she gave birth to, to Joseph, she, she said, One more, Lord. I want one more. Verse 18. <coughs> It came about as her soul was departing that she named him Ben Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. Interesting to note that death is not the end. Her soul was departing. Death is just the departure of the soul it is not the end of our existence mm -hmm. during that time dying a childbirth unfortunately is, is very common that's a common occurrence and at the deathbed Rachel calls his son what? what's his name? meaning what? No, no, the name is Ben Oni, meaning son of sorrow, son of trouble. She was experiencing great pains, great difficulty, and named his son similarly. Son of sorrow, son of trouble. But Jacob did not agree. Samia, no, I'll not call you that. I will call you Benjamin, son of my right. Son of importance. Normally at the right side is, is 
normally the one who sits at the right side of the host is the most important guest. It is the only child, Benjamin was the only child named by Jacob. He was the only child born in the promised land. Remember, Jacob was not living in the promised land. He just arrived in the promised land. And when he arrived in the promised land, the first thing that greeted him was what? Death. Death of whom? The maid servant, right? Of Rachel, the mom. That's the first thing that greeted him. Now, guess what happens in verse 19? So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephraim. No sooner than, than Jacob buried Rebecca's nurse, Rachel dies. Remember, God just protected Abraham, right? Oh, sorry. God just protected Jacob from the enemies around by instilling fear on them. Because of that, Jacob worshipped God. After that, guess what happened? God appeared to him and said, I will make you a great nation. Can you imagine how spiritually high you can get? Right? It's a spiritual high. You're worshiping God. God appears to you. God makes a promise. Right? Then all of a sudden, in your spiritual high, what happens? Death of the most loved person in your life. What would you feel? I mean, of all people, Lord, why did you take racial? The one that I love, the only thing that happened nice in my stay in Padam Aram. We know that for, for, for Jacob, nothing is too much for Rachel. Remember, he spent seven years trying to pay the bright, bright, bright price to Laban. And the Bible says it was like fast. Then he realized that on the wedding night, they gave Leah, the, the, the sister, the older sister that looks like a cow and is cross-eyed. And Laban said, you have to work another seven. And, and, and Jacob said, yes, I will. Because I love Rachel so much. But Lord, why did you take Rachel and not Leah? Right? I would choose Lord Leah and along. Why did you get her? I'm the, I'm the promised child. I'm the one you love. I'm in the promised land. But why did you take? Why is there great pain? If I'm in the promised land. Why is there hurt? If I'm in the promised land. Right? It's a great heartbreak for Jacob. One death after another. You know, if you watch Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, Freddie Mercury sang this song, right? Love of my life, you heard me. And this is the love of his life. He loved Rachel so much that he allowed Rachel to keep her gods. Right? Rachel stole the god of his father Laban, right? And, and because of that, the whole family was worshipping idols. And Jacob allowed that. Because Rachel, because she loved Rachel to a fault. And now she's gone. I realized something. Our spirituality and Christianity must traverse the rough roads of life. It must traverse the rough 
roads of life. God never promised us an easy life. Only a safe landing. I mean, I feel devastated. Verse 20, Jacob set a pillar over her grave that this pillar of Rachel gave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the towers, powers of either. I don't know how long you would mourn. I remember uh, uh, a kid. Um, the mom asked the kid, Oh, son, if, if I die, will you cry? And he said, yes. And the mom said, oh, how long should you cry? Mom, I'll cry for <laughs> one year, two years. Oh, so nice, so nice, so nice. Then the father said, oh, uh, son, if I die, will you cry? Yes, son. How long? Oh, that 100 years. Then, then the mom got mad. What is it? <laughs> I don't know how long. I don't know how long. Jacob cried for Rachel. But this is the painful thing. You would think it's all over, right? You would think the whole family would be in mourning. Not long after burying and grieving the death of the love of his life, guess what? Tragedy, tragedy, tragedy struck again. In the very household of God. Verse 22. It came about while Israel was dwelling in the land, that's Jacob, that Reuben went and lay with Belha, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Wow. Belha was the maid servant of Rachel. Remember when 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 um, Rachel couldn't bear any children, she gave Belha. So it's Rachel, Leah. Leah has a maid servant. Rachel had a maid servant who raped Belha, his oldest son. What? What's going on here? Why why is this all a mess, right? My wife just died. The maid servant of my wife is kind of my concubine basically. And typically what would happen is the concubine could take the place of of racial. That's why some commentators were saying that Reuben did that to defile what's your name? Um, Bel Belha? Belha. So that the next in line will be his mother, Leah, and not Belha. I mean, if you're in that house, what would you feel? When, when the son of, when the daughter, when the son of Leah heard that one of their sister, their sister, Dinah, got raped, they were angry. Why? Because Samia, how can this happen to the house of Israel? To a child of Israel? We will take vengeance. But when it happened in the very house, of Israel, everybody was quiet. Not even Jacob, not even his other son Joseph, no one protested. That's painful. Yet despite that, the family still remained intact. 
verse 16 to 18, we saw the birth of the last child, Benjamin, right? And because of that, Leah, uh, Rachel died. Verse 22, we now see the debauchery of the first child. This summarizes the, the earthly life of Jacob. From his last child that brought death to his family to his first child that brought debauchery to his family. First to last. It's all pain. And in between, she has a daughter that was strutting herself. That's why she got raped. He has sons that committed murder. After this, the sons of Israel, of Jacob, was enumerated in verse 23. The sons of Leah was Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, the one who just raped one of the concubines. Then Simon, the Levite, Judah, Ishkar, and Zebulun. The son of Rachel, Joseph, Benjamin. The son of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan, and Naphtali. The son of Zelpad, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher, these are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Eram. Jacob had left his house, father's house, with no possession. Now he comes back with 12 kids. God indeed was faithful in his promise to Jacob. But not without consequence. The house of Jacob was divided. Verse 27 to 29. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre at Kiria Arba where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last and died and gathered to his people an old man of ripe age and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. That ends chapter 35. It starts with the death of the servant of the mount and the mother. Then it continued to the death of Rachel. Then it continued to the treachery of his first son raping a concubine. Then it wraps up with the death of his father. What a day! What a chapter! Not to mention in chapter 34, right before that, as I mentioned, the daughter was raped and two of his sons slaughtered an entire city. I mean, try to imagine if your son, if your daughter was raped. If you come home and realize that your kid, my son, murdered someone. How much pain is that for a father? I repeat, Jacob, I love. The love of God does not mean that we will be protected from hurt and difficulty in our lives. In fact, it guarantees because those are the, that is the very instrument that God uses in molding us. I repeat, Earth is not the final destination. It is the preparation for the final destination. That is the homecoming of Jacob. That was his welcome party as he enters the promised land. As he reunites with his brother and his father at 
the grave of his father widowed himself. And looking back at his family, it's a family of tatters. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11 in talking about the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says this. Faith is being sure at what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. By no means this is the full definition of faith. But faith somehow depends on hope. Faith somehow looks at a future reward. Why do we say that? Jump to verse 6. It goes on to say, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek Him. In a large part, the rewards are what? Future. It is eternal. Some people feel that the rewards of Getting a gold medal in the Olympics. I don't know, Paolo. Have you ever desired to get to the Olympics? Yeah, right? Right, for sure. And and, and, and it's worth all. And some, you know, I, I read Michael Phelps, right? He has no Christmas. He has no birthday. He just swims and swims and swims and swims and swims. And swims. <laughs> yeah. And he says, it's worth the reward. It's worth Olympic gold. It's worth all the suffering it's all worth the sacrifice just to get the gold verse 13 of hebrews 11 continues this all died in faith not having received the thing promised but having only seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they are strangers and exile on this earth the faith of our patriarchs was not rooted was rooted on the rewards that they will receive not here on earth for they realized that they were what? Strangers. In exile. And that they are just passing through this earth. The challenge is the promises of God and our hope in God intersects with the here and now. That is the problem. The problem with Christianity now is that we want our rewards now. We tell ourselves now must be worthwhile. Christianity would be much easier if now is easier. We want the rewards. We don't want the storms. We don't want the sickness. We don't want the bills. We don't want this. We don't want that. And you tell me, Bob, this is not the Christianity that I signed for. Yes, that is true. Nevertheless, this is what Christianity is all about. This is the normal Christian life. It ain't a bed of roses. 
Jacob, Exhibit 1. Abraham, Exhibit 1. Paul, Exhibit 1. It is ludicrous to expect anything else from a world riddled with sin and corruption. It is outrageous to expect a life different from that. Not to mention you yourself is sinful and you yourself is corrupt. Mm -hmm. Remember Paul? What did Paul say? He had a thorn in his flesh. And he pleaded to God, Lord, take out this thorn in my flesh. He expected relief. But guess what? It did not come. God did not relieve him of the thorn in his flesh. You know what he said? In 2 Corinthians 12, when he was pleading to God, release me from this situation, he said this, my grace is sufficient for you. Lord, I want the relief. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. That's what he said. And all to the life of Paul, it was pain, misery. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, four more labors and far more imprisonment, beaten, beaten times without number, often dangers of death, five times I received from the Jews, nine, 39 lashes, three times I was beaten down with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. At night and day I've spent three that night and day I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at the sea, dangers from false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such eternal things, there is a daily pressure on me of concerns for all the churches. In 2 Timothy, in his last letter, Paul speaks of his disappointment because everyone in the province of Asia deserted him. And now he is left to defend himself solely with Caesar. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, Joseph, Stephen, Paul, Matthew, Mark, everybody. What makes us think that we are exempted? What makes us think that this should not be our case? The problem lies, I believe, with the church. The church has failed to say that this is the Christian life. It is a life of preparation. It's a life setting us up to die to ourselves and to trust in God and God alone. Yes, God said, I have came that they may have life in John 10, 10 and they might have it abundantly. But what is an abundant life? We are taught that our hope is in the here and now, as if we are already living heaven here on earth. 
We treat sufferings in our life as unnatural. We think that the goodness of God implies that we will not suffer. We think that God cares more for our happiness than our holiness. We think when the God says, I will comfort you, that means he will relieve us. We think when God says, I will protect you, means that there will be no harm. Yes, it's true. God is gracious. God is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, as Jonah said. Yes, it's true in Ephesians. He says he delights in showing us his mercies. He delights in lavishing us the riches of His grace. Yes, it's true in 1 Timothy. It says, riches provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In Psalm, it says, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ashes. Yes, that is true. But is that the only truth of God? Is this, is this all there is to God's character. Mm. Turn to Lamentations chapter 3, please. Mm. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 1 to 18 says, I am the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely against me he turned his hand repeatedly all the days. He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones. I will try to change the word he to God because he to here pertains to God. God has besieged and encompass me with bitterness and hardship in my in dark places god made me dwell like those who have long been dead god has walled me in so that i cannot go out god made my chains heavy verse 8 even when i cry out and call for help god shut out my prayer nine God has blocked my ways with huge stone. God has made my path crooked. God is to me like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in secret places. God has turned aside my ways and turned me to pieces. God has made me desolate. God bent his bows and sent me on as a target for his arrows. God made the arrows of his, of his quiver to enter into my inward part. I have become a laughing stock to all my people. They're mockery, they're mocking songs all the day. God has filled me with bitterness. God has made me drunk in wormwood. God has broken my teeth and with gravel. God has made me cower in the dust. My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. For I say, my strength has perished. And so, my hope from the Lord. And we struggle to conceive a God who would do such a thing. To put a man in such a hopeless and perilous situation that he will not hope in God. Yet we see God doing it nonetheless. How oh, wow. So when tragedy strikes, disappointment comes in at our door, we woefully are unprepared we have been taught to expect only good from the hand of God 
We are taught that trials and hardships are temporal. It is exception and not the rule. We have been told that the times of our deepest trouble, God will tenderly carry us like a father carries his child or a shepherd tends to his lamb. But sooner or later, in many times, in many lives, this expectation is shattered. Like Job, God said, Shall you indeed accept good from God and not accept adversities? Shall we just say that we we'll only accept the good things and not accept adversities? It's easy to rejoice when God gives us a parking in front of a mall. Right? Praise God. But when, when God doesn't give you a park, yeah, yesterday, right? Parking is horrible. But when parking is far and it's pouring and raining, we end up grumbling and complaining. When a child is born with a defect, when a young family loses a mother or father in a car accident, when trials and hardships are prolonged and protracted, faith can wither quickly. The overwhelming sense that God's presence begins to fade. Our contentment in God's comfort gives way to our anger in God. For his inaction. We sense our faith dissolving. True, God sometimes grants our prayer. And when he does, we're more than willing to give our testimony, explaining to the congregation that God delivered me, that he worked, he kept his promises. But what if? That miracle cure does not come. What if what you expect never came to fruition? Day after day, month after month, and the pain is excruciating. Some simply abandon their faith and walk away from God, thinking that it's all God's fault, that God failed them. I tell you something. Trials in our life is not meant to test if God is faithful. It is to test if we are faithful. It's giving. God is faithful. But the devil puts in our mind that he is not. Test is to show to God that we Remember Sarah? God promised Abraham, you'll have a child with Sarah. Year after year after year, disappointment. No kid, no kid. I try, I try, I try. They said, okay, here's Hagar. Hagar gets pregnant. What would you feel if you're Sarah? Man, I'm the problem. Not Abraham. He's fertile. And then what God said, after some time, God said again to Abraham, Tell it, Sarah, you'll have a son, you'll have a wife again. Can you I will have another child? You'll have a child. Can you imagine the feeling of Sarah? Another disappointment. Why did you remind me of a promise that he will not keep? First of all, God, you made a promise. Why are you not keeping it? Now that I have forgotten it, why are you reminding it? Did you just want to rub salt in the in the wound? Can you imagine the the frustration and the disappointment in the life of Sarah. But such episodes should prompt us to examine ourselves. What is a normal Christian life? It prompts us 
to bring into focus who God is and who we are. We live in a world of self-indulgence, hedonistic society we're in. We really think, all we think about is all about our comfort in life. We want happiness, Lord, not holiness. Lord, I want to be satisfied, not sanctified. Lord, I want to be filled and not be content. And if it does not go our way, we ask God and we complain, we get depressed, and we get angry to God. Remember what God said to the to the Jews before they entered the promised land. Let me read. You don't have to go there. It's in Deuteronomy 1 verse 26 to 33. It says, Yet you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the commands of the Lord your God. And you grumbled in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us. He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the land of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren has made our hearts melt away. The people are bigger, taller than we. The cities are larger and fortified to heavens. And beside, we saw the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, do not be shocked nor fear them. The Lord your God goes before you, will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt beyond your eyes. 31. And in the wilderness where you saw the Lord your God carried you just as a man carries his son in all the ways which you have walked until he came to this place. 32. But for all this, you did not trust the Lord your God. That was the rebuke of God to the Jews. Trials came in your life you grumbled, you complained. In all this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. Are we the same? But you tell me, but Bob, my situation is different. My situation is not like Jacob's. Right? My situation is unique. First Corinthians, and this is a common verse. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but that which is common to man. And God is faithful. How is he faithful? Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able? One. Two. But with the temptation will provide a way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. I realize there's something wrong with that verse. Right? It seems that there's a contradiction in that verse. And the, contradiction, the con contradiction is this. Where's that? Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. If you will escape the situation, why do you need to endure? Right? You escape it. Eh? What's the purpose of enduring it? Ah. The escape there is not escaping the situation. Right? If we escape the situation, we need not endure it. The problem with us is we want to dictate on God rather than, rather than, rather than accept the dictates of God. It is only when we have learned to accept our circumstance I'm not talking about sin and stop blaming others and God that we can start moving forward again in our Christian life. The way of escape 
that God provides us is to trust in God that He did not make a mistake. The way of escape is not dictating on God. It is accepting His dictates. Then you will able, then you will be able to endure it. When you stop blaming, when you start accepting, that is the time that you can move forward in your Christian life. We always thought that the way of escape is God taking us out of the situation. No. It is changing our understanding of the situation. When that happens, then we can endure. That's why Paul, despite his dis deep disappointments, remained confident. And his final testimony was this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is no store for me for the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. You remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples in Luke chapter 18? And his dis disciples were discouraged. You know what Paul, what, you know what Jesus said to them? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Why? Because Jesus knew you will need a lot of faith. Why? Because the road is rough. Will he find it? And he was talking to his discouraged disciples. And you know what he said? The, re the remedy there? He says, pray and not lose heart. I remember talking to somebody. As long as you're alive, there is hope. And I asked them, Ask me why. Because you can still pray. And that's what God said in Luke chapter 18. Pray and not lose hope. This is the normal Christian life. A life holding on to God and God alone. A life hanging on to Him and saying, Lord, I will not let you go help me because I cannot help myself. This is the life of Jacob. This is the life of Abraham, Isaac. This is the life of Paul. And this is the life of all genuine believers. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, you will be persecuted. Remember, my friends, this is not, earth is not the final destination. It is the preparation for us meeting Him. Thus, we need to learn to die to ourselves. We need to learn to stop controlling God, dictating on God, and start accepting His dictates on our life. Thus says the Lord. Amen. For a last song.